Hello and Durud to all our participants and our viewers. Thank you for joining us for this month's webinar with a very special guest, Mr. Sirius Sigari, who is an outstanding member of the Iranian community in the USA. Today, uh, Mr. Sigari will be in conversation with um, one of our media personalities here in the United Kingdom in the Iranian community, Ms. Aram Bolantaz, who has distinguished herself in a number of different media spaces um, that inform the Iranian diaspora and the Iranian community in Iran regarding um, our past, our present, and our future. My name is Tahir Dinesh. I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director of Persia Educational Foundation. Um, as you may know, our foundation is focused on supporting and promoting the cause of education among Iranians um, in the United Kingdom, uh, primarily at top universities here in the UK, as well as internationally accredited universities throughout Europe and elsewhere. We have established two particular scholarship funds that are pioneering in their nature. One is the Maria Mirzahani Scholarship, uh, which is focused on empowering Iranian women who are studying STEM at the doctoral level. We also have a second dedicated scholarship fund, the Ansari Scholarship Fund, which supports graduate students who are advancing discourse in the areas of human rights and public service. In addition to our scholarship, dedicated scholarship funds and general support of Iranian students, we also hold a number of educational events, including these monthly webinars, which we began during the uh, COVID era and have continued unabated. Uh, we bring together brilliant, bright, and outstanding Iranians who are transforming themselves and their societies for the better. Among them, of course, is our guest this afternoon, um, UK time, <laughs> this morning in the United States. Mr. Sigari, who is, of course, known to um, the majority of the Iranian community, is an aviator and an entrepreneur. He's also an investor in pioneering efforts. He founded a venture capital firm that invests in technologies that move people and goods in a cleaner, faster, safer, and more cost-friendly way on ground, air, sea, and space. In 2022, Mr. Sigari was appointed as the chair of the Arkansas Council on Future Mobility. He is a global leader in the world of business of private aviation. He has been flying airplanes and helicopters for many years. He's an instructor pilot. And um, as I understand, if, I, if I've understood it correctly, on 13 different jets, including Boeing 747. Mr. Sigari is a graduate of Purdue University's prestigious aerospace and aeronautical engineering program, and is also an Ironman triathlete and a self-admitted adventure junkie. So he has an appetite for exciting pioneering efforts, which is what we very much advocate at Persia uh, among Iranian um, diaspora and hope that our um, thirst for adventure will translate into pioneering and prosperous efforts for our motherland in not too distant future. Mr. Sigari will be in conversation, as I mentioned earlier, with dear Aram, um, who from this point on uh, will um, interview Mr. Sigari. If you have any questions, please reach out to us through our social media. Uh, we have already received a number of questions. All of these will be asked at the conclusion of the conversation between Mr. Sigari and dear Aram. So um, over to you, Aram Jan. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be hosting this session. I'm not gonna talk a lot of details. Gonna go straight to Mr. Sigari. Um, is it okay I say Cyrus or Cyrus? How? Whichever you prefer. It doesn't much matter. <laughs> so how did you get into flying? Well, I, uh, I got into flying. Um, it was kind of convergence of a few things. My father 
um, started flying when he was uh, in his right out of college. Uh, he's about 80 some odd years old now. So this is some, about 60 years ago when he was studying in the United States. Um, and so I had some inspiration from him when I was a you know, child. Um, when I was six years old, Top Gun came out and uh, that inspired me. And I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And uh, when I was 11 years old, I took my first flying lesson at the Santa Monica airport. And um, that uh, that's really where my entire flying sort of journey started was was from there. And 30 plus years later and 100 different types of planes and a couple thousand hours, I've uh, had the great pleasure of enjoying the world through the sky. Amazing. So there's always my understanding is when you pursue a career, you have a vision. Um, so what was Cyrus's vision from the time that you start? What was your dreams um, that today you could say you actually could catch them? Well, when I first started, my, my dream was just to fly. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't really have any aspirations beyond just getting to fly the biggest, fastest, most interesting airplanes in the world. But as I got older, entrepreneurship really became an area of, of passion for me. And um, and then starting businesses and learning how to run businesses. And then, then that is transposed over to helping other entrepreneurs by investing in them and, and, and supporting their, their visions. And But being very clear about the purpose of the types of companies that we're investing into, which is this idea of transforming the moving world by virtue of helping move people and goods cleaner, faster, safer, lower cost on the ground, air, sea, and space. So I, I think, you know, when I started, I had a vision, but once I got to the vision, you go to the next vision, next vision, and next vision. I think that's one of the key skills for an entrepreneur is to learn how to continue to evolve your vision as you achieve it. So what does really attract your attention these days to, you would say, I'm going to go and invest and, um, and make something new out of, out of this? What would that be? Well, look, at the end of the day, our purpose through the work we're doing now is to make the world a better place by virtue of making the movement of people and goods more accessible, lower cost, better for the environment. I think we're at the effectively the precipice of the second internet. The first internet provided very low latency, low cost, low access information to data. I want to know something, I know it. The second internet is the internet of matter. I want to have something, I have it. I want to be somewhere, I'm there. And it's done in a way that's low cost, low environmental impact and uh, and makes it accessible for all of humanity. So that, that's really the vision of where, where we ultimately want to go. So you said about the first internet, second internet, what about the third one, the web three? What what do you have to say about web web three? Do you see that how everyone else see as a way out, a way to future? Well, I, I would be clear that my, what I'm considering to be the second internet is not web 2.0 i mean it as like the internet of matter and and the web 3 that's talked about in the zeitgeist today is is still very different than how, how we think of the world my my ideation of what web 3.0 would be is less about you know the metaverse and crypto and all that i'd say it's more a, a web of spiritual connectivity and how does the world connect through spirit and and i think that's where we're I think intellectually connected through the, the call it the internet that we know today. I think there's a physical connection through this second internet, the internet of matter. And I think the, the third internet is that of, of spiritual connectivity. And uh, I think we've quite a, quite a ways to go around that, but it's the first time anybody's asked me that question. It's the first time I've given that answer, but I think I'm going to stick with it. So Cyrus, how flying, have, um, how flying has changed your career going forward? And if you could uh, tell us about the challenges that has come to your way. Yeah, flying has been one of the greatest um, teachers I've ever had. Um, I've almost lost my life a few times. I've um, over had to overcome incredible fears. I've seen places of the world that in some cases nobody else has ever seen. I've um sat in the cockpit with some of the most influential people in the world conversing and learning and building relationship and in one of the most beautiful places you can be at 45,000 feet over you name the beautiful vista and 
to me, it's um, a great place to get inspiration and to, um, to learn about humanity, to learn about technology, to learn about um, what it means to learn. And you know, I've had to learn a diff- lot of different types of airplanes and helicopters and, and uh, different types of skills. And I've had to fly in a lot of different countries. And you know, I'm primarily based in the United States and I've had the great pleasure of pretty much being in every corner of this country. Um, you know, United States is a, it's a very big country and it has a lot of different cultures. And, and I spend a lot of time in the different cultures. And I think what it means to be American um, is really a very, very complex answer. Um, it's, it's, there's what you see on Fox News and CNN, and there's what you see in the heartland, and there's what you see in Los Angeles, and you see with New York, and you see in Seattle. It's just it's this beautiful um, mosaic of humanity in, in this country. And, and, I don't, and I think it's um, really important for those that live here to understand what it really means to be American. Um, and as a first generation Iranian American um, whose parents left during the revolution and moved to the most logical place you can move to, which is New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, as you know, political refugees, um, and grew up in Los Angeles, become an entrepreneur, been able to live in lots of different areas. I really feel like an American, um, even though I'm my, my parents are, are from, from not here. Uh, actually, exactly what it means to be American. Uh, to have a place where people can go um, and pursue their dreams and to have no limitation in terms of where they can go um, only by their own aspiration and, and desire and hard work. I think that's the American dream. And I think back to your question of what has aviation taught me, that's what it's taught me. It's taught me of how, how do we go after our dreams and overcome our fears and connect and learn uh, about others and ultimately make the world a better place. Would you put your hand on any hard challenge that you would say that was the challenge that I had to overcome? Like, what was the hardest challenge you faced so far? Well, I, there's different challenges in different phases of my life. Being an Iranian American was very hard growing up in, in America. Um, you know, when I was in, I was born in 1982, and this was right after the hostage crisis in, in Iran. Um, and I remember there's billboards in New Orleans that said, Iran, let our people go. Um, and having to see that every day as a young child and see on the news every day for 444 days while Iran is the boogeyman and to see the, um, the cultural uh, aggression towards Iranians um, for majority of my youth was exceptionally hard. It was really, really hard. And uh, for a long part of my time as an as a Iranian youth, I wasn't very proud um, because I was being told by media not to be proud of my heritage and my background and um, something to be embarrassed about. And um, as I've gotten older, I realized that was such a gift. It was such a gift to get that those challenges. Um, you know, I, as being Iranian, we all enjoy pistachios. And I, I like to use the reference of Persian culture being like that of a pistachio and that there's this very hard shell that's hard to get through. But once you're through it, it there's this beautiful, rich, nourishing nut in the inside. And, um, and I feel like that's been my journey to crack through that really hard nut that was formed through the challenge of a country that's gone through the challenges it's gone through over the last 40 plus years and um, really get down to who am I and who are we and there's so much to be proud of in the past there's so much to be proud of in the present and I believe there's a tremendous amount to be proud of for the future as to what's to come and um, so I'd say that that has been one of the larger challenges is really figuring out who am I? And as a child of refugee parents growing up in this country, that is not the same anywhere. You know, in Iran, at least everybody looks Persian. <laughs> like you can, you can, there's a sense of unity. In America, it doesn't, it's not quite like that. And, and I think that's okay. And in fact, I think that's great. Um, as long as 
those that live in America particularly are aware of that's the design of what this country was made to be. And, and I think that's, that gets lost a lot as to um, what it means to be human and what it means to be part of a diverse community. So that, that's one, one particular thing. And then being an entrepreneur, you, know, you don't know what tomorrow brings. There's no such thing as certainty. And, and in fact, I'd say, even if you're an employee, there's no such thing as certainty. Look at the, the layoffs that have just happened in, in uh, the Bay Area, in San Francisco, the all tech companies where you know, people have worked at Google for 20 years, couldn't have more job security. They one day woke up, couldn't get on the internet or get onto their email. And so I think certainty of anything is a complete falsity. Um, and, and I think in the United States, as an example, um, and even in the UK and other parts of the world, certainty of stability is not something we should take for granted. Um, and I look at what happened in the United States on January 6th, and I look at the political turmoil that, that the country has gone through, that has woken up you know, a country that has been certain of its stability for a very, very long time, um, get to a place where it's really not all that different than some places that you and I are from. Um, and, and what I think that means as an entrepreneur, as an employee, as a citizen, as just a human being is never to get lazy and just assume that things are going to be okay. There's this like active participation in society, be it as a, as what you do in your professional life or in your social life in your spiritual life or in your family life of, of, um, chat, making sure things continue to go in the direction that's good for humanity. And so as this goes back to your question of what's been one of the challenges, as an entrepreneur, you don't know what, what's going to happen the next day and you have to be able to um, react with the information and skills you have at the time. And, um, and that is a muscle. And, um, and I think, you know, as a culture of, of, uh, of Iranians, we have 6,000 years of um, conflict and chaos in our blood. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, part of, it's part of our epigenetic design that we're actually very well suited for um, instability and conflict and chaos and learning how to bob and weave and dance within that, that tapestry, which um, is an exceptional trait and skill, I think, of our our collective people. Um, and it's, you know, you look at how a country for over 40 years um, has been cut off from the global economy. And no matter what the outside world has tried to do, it still kind of works in its own crazy way. Um, and, you know, we go into detail about why and how all that happened, but just the resiliency of the Iranian culture is so awesome. And, and I'm so grateful to have um, like received that as something to pe be passed down from, from my family and my grandparents. Amazing, thank you so much for sharing those. So my understanding was we talked a lot about the past, the challenges and the kind of, we haven't talked about the benefits, but if you could elaborate a little bit about the current situation in the USA for you being part of the Iran, I, I understand that you say you're very American, but I would say you somehow Iranian diaspora community, you would be part of it. So what are the challenges and also benefits of being the diaspora, Iranian diaspora community in today's USA? You know, um... What's really interesting in um, in today's diaspora experience that I've never experienced. I'm I'm 40 years old. You know, I've I've gone to a few events that are sort of coming to to for support of those in Iran through all the challenges that are going on right now. And these events were not put on by Iranians. They were put on by white people and Asians and the this like 
not, shocking experience of being events produced by non-Iranians for the benefit of Iranians, which is the polar opposite experience that I had growing up. And, and so I, I'd almost switch it around that I'd like to answer your question differently and say, as opposed to what's the challenge, what's, what's something that's really inspiring and exciting that's happening right now for the Iranian diaspora is to feel seen and it's to feel understood about this pain of being disconnected from your motherland for, for the four, you know, four decades. And um, there's a global awareness and compassion for particularly the women of Iran and the leadership and, and strength that's being shown through you know the this the challenge that's happened most recently i for iranian women to be looked up by every woman in every country in the world right now is extraordinary that's so cool and and to have Ira female iranian friends and family members whereas a male my job is to stand behind them and support them which is such a different construct to our culture you know our, it's a very patriarchal culture culture where the woman is supposed to stand behind the man um at least that's what has been sort of taught from generation to generation and um to actually see that shift the other direction is is quite inspiring and so i when you i have a hard time responding to what are the challenges of, of the iranian diaspora in the united states right now because it's a time of actual um solidarity and of of hope and of pride for um particularly those that are there now that are that are showing what it means to to um really fight for life liberty women and it's a great reminder to americans of what people will go through to get freedom. And it's so easy for the Western world to lose sight with how hard it was to get this type of freedom. What sacrifices were made, what lives were lost to have the ability to have the American dream. And um, I was recently with the um, original constitution in the United States. And, um, and I, was, I was reading it and thinking about the, the place and the time in the world that that document was written. What was it like? And, and I think that's just such an inspiring thing to really go back and be in the, the, um, the mindset of those that, that wrote that document. And, and what greatness it's created as a result of it. So again, a meandering way of answering your 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 question, but it's 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 what comes to mind. So you talked about hope. Um, are you excited about the future? I I don't know if it serves anyone to have a perspective other than that. Like I, I don't I don't see a case where allowing oneself to not be hopeful, even in the worst of situations, be it health issues, um, financial issues, whatever it might be, that there's never a time where that's okay. And so I think it's actually a um, mindset that if um, and it's, as an entrepreneur, you must absolutely have an attitude of gratitude and hopefulness to be able to survive because every day something is attacking you. And, and so, um, yeah, I'm really hopeful about the future. Um, otherwise, why would I, I get up? And you know, I understand that there will continue to be challenges along the way, and there's a timing for things to get better in certain ways. But my, my sense is if every human on the planet all of a sudden went to a place of hopefulness versus fear, 
there'd be like an instantaneous change in the sort of realities around us. And um, I know there's evils out there and I know there's food shortages and I know there's all sorts of challenges to be worried about, but there's, there's a interesting balance there. And um, so yeah, so I'm what, really what particularly um, excites Cyrus about the future? Um, you know, I, you know, the internet, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, provides effectively information for free. Anybody anywhere can have access to anything, any type of information, unless you're in a country where you don't have access to it. So the proliferation of education and knowledge to me, particularly to those that haven't had the ability to get access to it, is exceptionally exciting for um, the youth in countries that have had very, very little access to education. In some places, Iran, some places in Africa, and other places in the Middle East and Latin America, like getting these sparkles of, of potential genius, getting access to information and, and a new Einstein being created or whatever it might be, um, is, is exceptionally cool. And then getting tools like, you know, there's a lot of discussion these days about AI and chat GPT and all these things. I'm not fearful of them at all. Um, I actually just see them as uh, democratizing intelligence and allowing people to solve problems quicker without having to ask someone. Now, there's a whole discussion around can you trust AI and this, that, and the other. And I, I hope that humanity and those that are part of building that have a little bit of like they want to survive as well. So they would design it in such a way that we all kind of go in the right direction. So access to, to education. Two is the everything that we've ever been promised as children in the cartoons, whatever it might be, all of it's coming true. Flying cars, rockets to the moon, drones delivering Walmart packages to people's backyards, cars drive themselves on the street, effectively free transportation with electrification. getting a Harvard education from home. You know, the one or two things that hasn't shown up yet that it's on its way is being able to live forever if you wanted to through, you know, whatever, various sort of healthcare um, impacts. So which which incredible is whatever we imagine we can have as a society and as an individual. Um, and, and that's pretty darn exciting. And so I think humans are going to continue to um, become less driven um, to do like manual labor and will be have two jobs, to be creative and to love. And, and that's pretty cool. Um, I think the world's gonna be really great when people get to focus on those two. Amazing, I agree too. Um... Going to Iran situation currently, what are you yourself doing to help the current situation in Iran? Um, you know, I, the biggest area that I feel I can help is to be a good citizen here. Um, and to support those spiritually, emotionally, through prayer, through counsel, to talking to particularly my um, female Persian country people that are going through a different type of pain than, than perhaps uh, the men, you know, to, to have to deal and see with the challenges they've been going through. Um, and to help wherever anybody asks me to help, however I can. There's limited things we can do from being here um, to, to those that are, are in the country. And I wish there was more to do. I don't know how. And, um, but I think helping 
shine a light on the courage and the um, hopefulness and the um, resiliency of uh, those that are there is, is I think incumbent on all of us. And should things ever change in the future to take all of the blessings that we've had as those that have been able to flourish in the Western world and to redirect that energy and love and prosperity back to Iran. Um, and so that is definitely something I'm very excited about. There's a time and place where um, those of us who are not there now um, can go back and be of service to our, our, our culture and to our, our motherland. Um, and I, I'm pretty much working every day to prepare myself for that, for when that opportunity is. Do you have any suggestions for the students, Iranian students or the students in, in the West? Um, um, it's probably easier for me to give suggestions for those in the West. Maybe a few for those that are there right now. For those in the West, I think the single best thing you can do is, is to be, to show up and to be the best representation of your culture as possible. And to continue to be um, world-class in anything and everything you do. Um, and so if and when there's an opportunity for those that want to go back and to be of service to their, their culture, that they are prepared. And, and I think that's a sacred duty uh, for those that are in the West that have access to uh, education and jobs and creativity and whatever the things are that we, we benefit from being in the West to those have a desire that want, maybe want to go back to be world-class and get this collection of world-class individuals to uh, be able to support their, their their motherland if and when the opportunity shows up. For those that are there, it goes back to my earlier point of um, it does not help to be anything other than hopeful. And and I think sharing that um, that level of of positive attitude and support and love. Um, will eventually outshine some of the things that are trying to dampen that light. And, and I wish I could give explicit clarity on, on how to change things that are going on there. But, you know, that, that, those challenges, you know, diamonds are formed by pressure. And I believe there's some exceptional diamonds that have been formed uh, in Iran by virtue of the pressure that's been put on that society, both in, in the country and outside. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask if there's anything else that uh, you would like to share with us specifically about your next move. What is next for Cyrus currently? Well, um, I'm a new father. So that's that's a really big congratulations. Nexus. Thank you. And, um, you know, my 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 son is uh, half Persian and half American or, you know, traditional American, if you will. And, and, and really making sure that I do an exceptional job of teaching him uh, where he comes from is really important to me and to, to protect him from anything other than being proud, like making sure he's, he's able to understand the challenges that his parents and his grandparents and his great-grandparents and his great-grandparents went through for him to show up here. There's a really interesting uh, data point that if you go back 400 years, that's about 12 generations, that's 4,000 individuals to create you. It took 4,000 people over 400 years for you and I to be alive. And if any one of them failed, we wouldn't be here. And to think about the struggles and the winds and the pain and the suffering that it took for those individuals for us to be created 
and to honor that, but then also to look forward that in 400 years, my son hopefully will be one four thousandth of an individual on the other end of that. And that if, if he fails, that person doesn't get to be created. Um, and so I'm really excited about becoming a dad and, and um, teaching some of the lessons and learn through my, my, um, my journey to, to him and, and have him being a, a real model citizen for society. Um, outside of that, I'm so thrilled about the work I get to do as an investor in the future of technology, that our mission is to make the world a better place by transforming the moving world and helping move people and goods cleaner, faster, safer, lower costs on the ground, air, sea space. And we literally see, um, we saw about 2000 companies last year. We invested in about 10 of them. Um, every day I see something that makes me go, oh my God, this is such an amazing time to be alive. I might not invest in it because we can't figure out if it's gonna work or make money, but to see the creativity and the excitement and the, the trends headed in the right direction, yes, we'll make some mistakes individually and as a collective, but I think in the, at the end, um, it's going to be good. And now it's not going to be good. It's going to be great. And I think uh, being able to be reminded of that is um, really important for me, for my son, for my family, for my neighborhood for my state, for my country, and I think the whole world. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation with you. All the best from my side. I'm going to pass it back to Tahre, and she might want to ask any more question. Thank you. Thank you both very much for this amazing conversation. I think it's one of the most um, uplifting conversations that I've been um, uh, privilege to be a part of uh, during these past few months that our motherland has been going through a great deal of trouble and turbulence. So your commitment to a hopeful vision of um, not just our future, but what we can do today is I think the panacea that we need in order to empower the younger generation to keep going. Um, in that light, um, there are three specific questions that had been sent to us earlier that I wanted to share with you and see what sort of insights and information you could share with us. One is um, in, in the spaces that you are a part of, um, what are the things that you feel um, we could do with our state officials to bring their attention and their resources to assisting the younger generation who are striving to access their rights in Iran? You know, I think, um, you, I, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to work with some folks in government here. Um, and you'd be, I'm shocked at how little they really know about what's going on there. Um, and I think the being educating others in a way that doesn't feel like you're uh, preaching to them, you know, it's, it's a fine balance of, of educating um, others to care about your problem and to, to inspire empathy is not easy. It takes a lot of like thoughtfulness and, um, Storytelling. I think storytelling is one of the most important skills that is underemphasized in education. Presidents become presidents because they're great storytellers. CEOs become CEOs because they're great storytellers. You know, you, you name it, like some of the greatest jobs on the planet, the most powerful people in the world are just really, really good storytellers as a requirement to be in that job. And I think as we, we figure out collectively to, and for those that are in government, what story is it that we want to tell to, and how do we deliver that story in a way that inspires action and support um, is, is sort of the incumbent opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Storytelling, as you know, has been part of Iranian tradition for generations. In fact, we mark the longest night of the year 
by gathering around our loved ones and uh, engaging in the practice of storytelling. So thank you for highlighting that, not only as a tool for family building and for um, passing on tradition from one generation to the next in our private spaces, but as a part of civic participation and agency in improving the chances of success for the current generation to access rights and democracy in Iran, in all the public spaces that we have access to. The other question that has reached us is, um, given the challenges that the uh, current generation is facing in Iran, and of course, on a daily basis, um, these challenges multiply, um, what kind of innovation tips do you have for them to be able to read their reality and to um, take advantage of the gaps that exist to um, bring about access to whether it's it's you know dealing with the economic challenges that we're dealing, um, food shortages, malnutrition, um, security issues, internet, anything of that nature. What are the basic principles that, as an innovator and an entrepreneur, uh, you would like to communicate with your countrymen in in Iran and around Iran um, to help them um, live a better life? You know, um, it's not clear to me that I could give guidance on how to best operate within an economy that's under such tremendous pressure, be it from sanctions or inflation, food shortage, whatever it may be. But there is a, a truth that really, I think, independent of any situation remains clear, which is if you are able to help somebody that is in more need than yourself, you usually end up doing better. And, um, and there's always somebody that's got it worse off than you. Um, and so in those moments where we, we look at our own challenges and say, man, I'm in trouble. There's somebody that is in more trouble that you can probably help. And I am a spiritual person. I believe in God. And I, and I believe that as we shift our attention away from our own woes and challenges onto those that um, we can help, some magical things happen and our own, own challenges somehow get resolved and opportunities are created for us. And, and perhaps this falls in the category of the third internet that we talked about before of this spiritual internet of connectivity, of, of our hearts connecting with one another and, and supporting one another in ways that um, may not be obvious because we're in so much pain. And, um, and for some reason, some way, no matter how bad we got it, there's somebody that has it worse. Um, and, and so um, it's not exactly what I think the answer to the question you're looking for, but it's the best one I've got. Well, they'll have to do then if that's the best one you've got, but it is pretty practical. And actually, um, I think it addresses a number of um, issues that we've faced in our society over the decades. And that is, we seem to feel that the challenges that we're facing are particular to our nation, but they're not. These are some of the birth pangs and death, death pangs of the change in global order that we are experiencing in a number of different countries. And exactly as you said, if we look at those around us, of course, in the case of Iran, we're having a horrendous situation at this moment, but we just look next door um, and see what's happening with women in Afghanistan. And that should give us every trace of hope possible to know that not only we're able to um, become the diamonds under pressure that you refer to, but actually to set the precedence for others to arise to the same level of heights that the Iranian women backed by Iranian men are rising to. So that's something that gives us a great deal of food for thought. Um, the final question out of the qu questions that we have received that I want to share with you is, um, what tips do you have for the younger generation in terms of the type of education that you feel would be most useful over the coming decades? 
Oof, decades. I'm, um, I'm lucky if I can tell you the next year because things are changing so fastly. You know, everything's changing so fast. You know, it's um, like, I think this, this AI coming online is just incredible. You know, the, um, what's, what's really interesting is that there's, there's a new type of job that's being created, which is called a prompt engineer, which means that you're really good at asking questions of AI. And if you look at, um, you know, before the most recent exposure and convergence of um, chat GPT and some of these other large language models, something came out right before that were these uh, image creators where you could send, you know, Dolly 2 is the most recent one and Mid Journey and a few others. But you could say, make me a picture of a Persian guy sitting in a field eating pistachios and within three seconds, this beautiful piece of art is created. You don't have... You don't have to be an artist anymore in the in the traditional way. You don't need to have, know how to work Photoshop. You don't need to know have a pen. You don't. Have, you get to be creative. D uh, creativity is becoming democratized, but you need to have command of language, and that is becoming the most important skill. Is can I use language back to storytelling to inform a machine to be able to do what I needed to do? That is a really important skill for people to develop. Um, and I think more traditional services, technical skills, I think are going to be gone. But back to what I said earlier, is like, I think humans are going to have two jobs, to love and to, to be creative. And we use tools to do that. Really interesting uh, piece of data. If you take 10 animals from an eagle to an ant to um, a dog or horse, whatever, maybe in a human, and you measure their efficiency in moving from like one spot to another, the human is like in the 50 percentile. It's not as, it's five or more efficient and five or less efficient. We're not particularly efficient movers. However, a human on a bicycle is two times as efficient as the most efficient animal, which is a type of bird. What does that say? It says that humans are exceptionally good at creating tools to make them more useful. And I think AI is simply an example of that as we continue to extrapolate forward. And so um, the creative arts and being able to tap into an imagination of what could be and being able to have create visions of things is an area that I think people will be very well served to build out as a skill set. Thank you very much. Um, I think we all agree that over the past couple of decades, the social pressures that Iranian youth have been facing has resulted in the burgeoning of artistic expressions. One example being the underground music scene in Iran that we're all familiar with, or the award-winning movies that Iranians have been producing over the past few decades. Um, in addition, the other character that you've highlighted, the capacity to love, is something that is warp and wolf of our of our culture. Of course, you know, symbolized by the poetry of uh, perhaps Hafez of Shiraz, who writes so much about the power of love, not only as an emotion but as a creative force in reality. So I have no doubt the remarks that you have shared resonate. Um, not only with the current generation of Iranian youth, but with those of us who perhaps have been young long ago and have seen how the spirit of creativity and love has emanated from the Iranian population, despite what we've been going through. So I join you and Aram in remaining extremely hopeful um, for the future of Iran, not the distant future only, but the immediate future. Our capacity to love each other despite our differences is the greatest gift that we can give our nation. And our ability to come together and create new pathways, democratic pathways for cooperation, for consultation is the best way that we can move this movement forward. 
So I'm incredibly grateful to you, um, dear Mr. Sigari, and to dear Aram John for taking the time out of your busy schedules to share this conversation with our loved ones in Iran and around the world. Um, I look forward to the opportunity to welcome you and other speakers during our future webinars here at Persia. And I wish to invite everyone to become part of Persia by supporting our educational spaces and scholarships. Thank you again for your time, for everyone who's been here with us this afternoon and everyone who will be joining us online.